All right, this one is my story. It's called uh, XMR Numbers. Here we go. After 16 hours of repairs to the starboard plasma manifolds, Commander Warren was summoned to the bridge. The turbo lifts were a bit shaky, but still functional. Corridor paneling had been either blasted or pried open by several unskilled crew personnel doing what they could to effect repairs after the last battle of Everness V. There had been many. James Warren wondered why he would be summoned to the bridge when it was obviously a poor use of an engineer's time. So many repairs still needed to be made that sleep was a luxury no one had the currency to afford. Exiting the lift was a bit of a shock. James had been so busy in engineering affecting repairs that he hadn't considered what had happened to the bridge. There were bloodstains still moist at the helm and weapon station. Power cables, burnt terminals, and flickering displays told him the story. The command staff had suffered just as much as the rest of the crew. Captain Alexander looked far beyond tired. Her uniform had a slight tear. There was system lubricant sprayed all up her pants and her back, and blood on her knees where she must have knelt to help the dying. Commander Warren, I'm glad you could find a working turbo lift. I have news for you. In the Nausicaan sector, the ship Tolkien lost its captain in a recent firefight. Starfleet asked me to find a replacement. You'll be headed to the Tolkien in 20 minutes. Oh, and congratulations. You're to receive a field promotion to captain effective immediately, said Captain Sonia Alexander. She barely had strength to look at James. Pardon, ma'am, but I am needed here. The Ajax is a wreck and we are short-handed. I can't leave now. James was never more serious. Captain Warren, the Tolkien has lost their captain in a recent firefight near Nausicaa. They have one engineer and no commanders left alive. The Ajax has two commanders aboard and three engineers. You do the math. Sonia's look of fatigue suddenly left. It was replaced with a growing sense of both anger and urgency. Sensing the futility of arguing with such a strong officer, James capitulated to Sonia. On my way. Two days later, the Tolkien looked sound enough from the outside when James flew by in a shuttle. Minus the dozen or so marks along the lower decks and port side nacelle, she looked in fair shape. Inside was entirely different. Most of what he saw was similar to the Ajax. The Klingons were very good at killing Federation ships and crew. He was met in the shuttle bay by Lieutenant Claiborne. She looked too young to be aboard a starship, let alone in war. She could barely muster a smile with her salute. Hello, Lieutenant. James returned the salute. Take me to the acting captain. I should take command of the ship right away. That would be me, sir. Our lieutenant commander is in sickbay recovering from burns suffered from a blown conduit. He'll be sedated for a week, I'm told. Claiborne looked eager to relinquish command as soon as possible. Very well then, lieutenant. I relieve you, James said with a sigh. It was almost a heavy sigh, but he knew that now he had to be an example as well as encourage morale. I stand relieved. Taking over a ship from a respected captain was difficult under the best of circumstances, but under a flag of war, and after the captain had been killed in action, the difficulty of taking the leadership role was multiplied a hundredfold. But James had to do it. His standing order was to restore the ship to whatever possible condition he could within two days, for an offensive to retake Nausicaa. Rumor had it that the new Ares-class ship was making headway against the Klingon forces, such being true, the Tolkien was to join with a small fleet, including two brand new Ares ships, in an effort to rout out the Klingons. This was an important offensive. When Nausicaa had fallen, it had an effect on the Nausicaan warriors that other battles never had. It took away their pride. And a Nausicaan without its pride was nothing. Three days on. The fleet was ready for the assault. James had devoted almost all of his time to assist in two things aboard ship. He helped with repairs to the damaged systems 
and he helped with repairs to the damaged spirits. Like most crews in the Federation at the time, the mounted losses were more than difficult to bear or understand. Understanding had to come later, though. Fighting had to come now. That needed both courage and heart. It became clear to James why he was selected to be captain of the ship. He was a natural at helping people feel good. He could inspire, he could laugh, and he could even empathize with anyone, including the Andorians. But his biggest gift to the crew was faith. He never once showed any signs of defeat or surrender. Though he was tired like the rest, he only showed an assurance of victory. Nausicaa was a long and tough fight. The airy ships were amazing with speed and maneuverability that no other ship could match. At the end of the battle over Nausicaa itself, all of the ships and crew had regained their drive to succeed over the Klingons with undaunted confidence. In the aftermath, the derelict bird of play was still in nearby orbit. Why the Klingons hadn't scuttled their ship meant that somehow the crew was incapacitated or the self-destruct was inoperable. Either way, the ship had to be investigated. Three strike teams from the Tolkien were assigned to the derelict, while the rest of the fleet moved on to their next objective. It was James's orders to secure the ship and remain near Nausicaa for security. They would be one of two ships since the region was so spread thin of battle-capable starships. On the first reports aboard the Bird of Prey, the assault teams met absolutely no resistance. Their investigations found that there had been a system-wide power outage, even the environmentals had failed. The crew of 61 Klingons and one Gorn had suffocated rather quickly during the battle. Fortunately for the Federation, this left them with a golden opportunity that James wasn't going to pass up. Sir, 2nd Lieutenant Franklin reporting, came the call from one of the team leaders aboard the Klingon ship. What is it, Lieutenant? James replied as he sat in the captain's chair on the bridge. We got it all. The ships, the computer, everything. We got seriously lucky. In a more cautious tone, James asked, Will the ship fly, Lieutenant? Not at present, sir, but it is salvageable. It might take a few days, but... Franklin was interrupted. Lieutenant, I want the drive signature frequencies and friend and foe codes as fast as you can get them. They will be of no use to us in a few days when the crews are supposed to report in. Also, see if there's any information on shipyards. Aye, sir. Six hours later, James's crew were at their best. They had gotten the information that their captain wanted and had made adjustments to the Tolkien. James was about to break his orders and had the full approval of the crew. The drive signature and the friend and foe codes were now part of the Tolkien. James and his eager crew were going hunting. With the deceptive drive signatures and with the location of two of the three shipyards that were building the rumored D-7, the Tolkien was going on a deep recon. James had heard from Captain Alexander that the Federation had learned about a new Klingon ship presumed to be the D-7. What wasn't known was how many were being built. This now became an opportunity for the Federation that James wasn't going to ignore. He was taking his crew into a nebula nearby one of the shipyards building these new ships. It was hoped that they could discover the size, capability, and numbers for the new ship. Three days into Klingon space. The trip had been blessed, it seemed. The Tolkien remained unchallenged the entire voyage. Now that they had reached the nebula, James had the ship coast to within sensor range. This was going to take a few days, but knowing the Klingons, James was sure that the area would be under heavy surveillance to avoid exactly what he was attempting. If nothing else, the lack of drive signatures wouldn't attract any mines that would probably be present within the nebula as well. Petty Officer Hayes, this is your captain. I want a shuttle rigged with a similar drive signature as the Klingons. Make sure the shuttle is completely outfitted for long-term flight, ordered James to the crew at the shuttle bay. He had a hunch and wasn't going to let it be ignored. The same hour, the information that they were hunting started to come in. Captain, we're getting strong readings finally, said the comms officer. 
It had been sitting just inside the nebula 3 AU from the shipyard. What do you have? asked James. The shipyard is currently building two of the new ships. They're big. It looks as if they have two more that have been recently completed, came the reply from the comms. All right. If there are three shipyards building this thing, that could put operational ships numbering in six or eight. If they have four yards, the number could be nearing the teens. Helm, turn us about slowly. Once we have a shot at warp, punch it. We can outrun these Klingons. Aye, Captain. Somewhere between 60 and 80 degrees within the turn, the starboard side of the saucer section found a 20 megaton nuclear mine. There were hole breaches, casualties, in the dozens, and worst of all, they were exposed to the Klingon sensors. Amidst all the emergency procedures and among all of the calls throughout the ship trying to assess the damage and effect repairs, James made a call. Lieutenant Franklin, this is the captain, are you alive? The reply came within seconds. Aye, Captain. Lieutenant, grab the nearest two people that can run. Get you and them aboard that modified shuttle. Head home and don't look back. The shuttle will hold all of the information we gathered. Sir, there is a relay here that is vital to the ships he didn't get a chance to finish. Go now, Lieutenant, or you will be shot. James then went about preparing what was left of his ship for combat. Two minutes later, 2nd Lieutenant Franklin and Davis, as well as Petty Officer Hayes, were speeding off at warp 5.7 when they saw it on their monitors. Two birds of prey had assailed the Tolkien. The shields of the Tolkien only could handle two torpedoes before they failed. In a last-ditch effort to keep the shuttle undetected and undaunted, James scuttled the ship. The explosion destroyed both Klingon vessels and allowed the shuttle to escape without detection. Four days later, 1st Lieutenant Franklin, Davis, and 2nd Lieutenant Hayes were given marks for bravery and promotions. The information was greatly needed and for some top secret plan that the Federation had in store for the Klingons, but they were never told. Franklin, however, was witness to the brilliant plan at the future Battle of Axanar. That's the end of mine.